Happy Sabbath, church. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. My name is Pastor Larissa, and I am stoked to be here for the first time with you guys. Even though we can't be in person, I'm glad that we are here together online. Um, as you guys are getting used to me, and as I am getting used to you, um, one thing that you'll find is every time I preach, I want to do something a little bit different. And I'm actually going to take off my shoes. So every time I preach, I'm going to take them off because in the Old Testament, there's a time where Moses encounters God at the burning bush. And he says to take off your shoes for where you are standing is holy ground. And I believe that whenever we come together, that we are standing on holy ground with God, that we are here together with him. My title for today's sermon is called The Born Identity. And we're going to be looking at Acts 21 and 22, um, but then we're going to be specifically focusing on um, Acts 22, 22 through 29. Now, I understand you guys have been going through Acts, and you've been learning a little bit more about that, and so I'm excited to share a little bit more in depth into more of what was covered a little bit last week by Pastor Sergio. Bruce Wayne, Peter Parker and Clark Kent. If you've grown up reading or watching any sort of media, you know that these names have meaning. You know them as Batman, Spider-Man, and Superman. And these characters fascinate us because they have abilities to live separate lives. One as hero and the other as human. Dual identities, yet the same person. Yet nothing is as strong as their born identity. Without being Bruce, Peter, or Kal-El, which is Superman's real name, they wouldn't have a second identity. And we've come to love these characters because they're significant, they're important, each of these identities. And you can't have one without the other. You can't have Bruce or Peter or Clark without having Batman, Spider-Man, or Superman. As I mentioned before, my title for today is called The Born Identity, and we're going to be looking at Paul's dual identity, which can be found in Acts 22, and how that really relates to us. We're going to be looking at two different parts inside of Acts 22. We're going to be looking at some cloaks and some dust and some cool things that we find in that, but we're also going to be looking at Paul's citizenship. So to give you a little bit of background information, I know you covered it a little bit last week, but some of you may have not been there. So for this point in time in Acts 21 and 22, Paul has been traveling for some time. He's finishing up his third missionary journey, and his missions are well known at this point, but also not. Um, people know about the Gentiles, and there's also a lot of misunderstandings that we're seeing here. And so some essential background to understanding what the heck is going on in Acts 22, we need to understand Acts 21, and I'm going to be looking specifically at 30 through verses 30 through 40. I'm not going to be reading through those, but if you have any questions in there, um, that's where they'll be found. So there's outrage in Jerusalem. Paul has come to the temple in Jerusalem, but he's done it with Gentiles. Doing it with Gentiles is against Jewish law, and we'll get a little more into that as we go. Um, and the police goes into complete panic, so much so that Roman troops come, and it's loud, and it's rowdy, and Paul is bound and taken to the barracks. And he convinces the commander to speak to the people and he speaks to the commander in Greek. Now, I want you to note this because this is very important. He speaks to the commander in Greek and convinces him to speak to the people. And so when he goes to talk to the people and the commander has given him permission, he, he switches languages to Hebrew. Also, some of your Bibles may say Aramaic. And so he switches to Hebrew and Ara or Aramaic and he tells his conversion story. And the whole place is silent. They are raptured by Paul telling his conversion story. Until 
verse 21 of chapter 22, which is where we're going to start reading together. So that's Acts chapter 22, verse 21. And he mentions the Gentiles. He said, Then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And this is the exact reason that they're angry in the first place, because Paul has brought Gentiles to the temple, and they lose it. And this is today's section of focus where we're going to be looking at. This is going to be found in Acts 22, 22 through 29, and we're going to be reading verses 22 through 24 right now. So that's once again Acts 22, 22 through 24 together. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. So Paul obviously upsets the people and they're not prepared for what he's saying. You see, according to Jewish law, the Jews didn't believe that anyone deserved to be in the temple outside of purified people. And according to who they believed was purified, the Gentiles did not make that list. And so Paul bringing Gentiles in the temple completely goes against Jewish law at this time. And they are angry that he has done this. He has defiled the temple by bringing these Gentiles there. And so they start doing two things. They start throwing off their cloaks and they start throwing dust into the air. Now, this feels like a very interesting way to respond. And so I decided to look deeper and research this to find out if there was greater significance to this act when you look deeper into the context. So let's go into the throwing off of the cloaks. When you look at the historical context of it, it's actually really intriguing. According to Bryce C. Jones, who wrote the meaning of the phrase, and the witnesses laid down their cloaks in Acts 7, 5 through 8, he found that in biblical and in Greek literature, concluding that the examples of a removal of a garment suggest that the gesture signified an impeding act of violence and many times death. So we see this several times in Greek literature and in the Bible. In the stoning of Stephen, they took off their cloaks. They removed them. Um, in Theophastus, um, twisting the bull's neck in Greek literature, he took off his cloak before doing so. Sixth century poet Hipponex, when he tells someone to hold his cloak because he's going to go punch someone, also found in Greek literature. Um, Alcibiades taking off his cloak and wrapping it around his arm before going out with a sword. Plato describing the attack on Socrates. We see this over and over and over again. Um, and the list goes on. So I had to ask myself, would Greek culture really be in Jerusalem at this time? My research did not disappoint me. So according to John B. Polhill, who wrote the book Paul and His Letters, he found that Hellenism, which is also known as Greek culture, had penetrated the entire civilized world by the first century. The Romans were at its most ardent supporters, he says. Jerusalem would have been familiar with the Greek culture, and Paul's teacher, Gamaliel, had a reputation of being open to the study of Greek learning. Another author, Halver Moxes, who wrote Theology and Conflict Studies and Paul's Understanding of God in Romans, also said that these acts express a strong reaction of displeasure and judgment. And the reason is because God has been dishonored and held in contempt, and thus strong reactions are necessary. So basically, if someone was to throw off their cloak in this time, this is the modern day example of hold my drink because it's going down. And so we see the people throwing off their cloaks, and this is significant. They say something is going down, and it may be your death. Another thing that they um, end up doing that we find interesting is they throw dust into the air. 
I don't know about you, but that would not be my first reaction if I was upset at someone just like grabbing some dust and throwing it up. Seems a little weird. So I looked into that and tried to see what was going on with that and found that the Greek word there is koniotos. Um, that's K-O-N-I-O-R-T-O-S. And this word is also used in Mark 10, 14, Luke 9, 5, Luke 10, 11, and Acts 13, 51. And it's all related to when the apostles were told to shake off dust off of their feet in order to um, testify against the cities that didn't receive them. It's the same word that's being used. And so we see that example of them shaking off the dust off their feet, and all of a sudden we see these people throwing dust in the air. And so essentially, when we look at this word, the Jews in this time in Jerusalem are telling Paul that they are going to kill him, and they are renouncing and denouncing him from their culture and religious beliefs. So Paul is used to not being accepted. God told him to go to the Gentiles, and a lot of the Jews didn't agree. It's in a pretty strong story. And we see him being disowned culturally, religiously, personally, and emotionally. Sometimes when we tell our stories, honestly, it's not what people want to hear. When I was deciding what uh, university to go to, Walla Walla was the one I had my eye on. I was so excited to go, um, but I ended up finding out in May of my senior year that Walla Walla had decided to drop my degree. Um, this was very devastating for me because I felt a very strong conviction that God had wanted me to do this bachelor, which is called speech communication. And so I made the decision to stick with what I had felt God calling me to, and I switched universities to a Christian university in Spokane called Whitworth University. And you wouldn't believe the things that people told me. They would say things like, oh, I'm sure God didn't mean for that to happen. Like, I think you were supposed to be at Walla Walla. I think you heard God wrong. God wants us to go to these schools. Oh, there's no way God would have wanted that. And I got told that over and over and over again. Sometimes people aren't going to want to hear our stories. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're in the wrong. It just means that we have a different experience, a different perspective, a different thing that God has revealed to us. And sometimes that's hard for other people because they aren't ready to hear it. I want to encourage you that if you've ever felt less than in telling your story, that your story is worthy no matter what. Your story is worthy. I really look forward to hearing those stories, um, being here at Richland, getting to know each and every one of you. And I want you to know that I am excited to hear your story. It may not be the conventional way. It may be a very different roundabout way. But your story is valuable and worthy. So now that we know about the dust and the cloaks and what was being signified to Paul as this was going on, let's keep going in Acts 22. We're going to be reading from um, verses 24 through 29. So that's Acts 22, 24 through 29. And the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. And as they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do? He asked this man as a Roman citizen. The commander then went to Paul and asked, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. But I was born a citizen, Paul replied. 
Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. So why does it matter if Paul is a Roman or not? Well, when you look at Roman law, going back to the historical context here, we find that Roman citizens were very rarely sentenced to death. Actually, by law, a Roman citizen couldn't, could be condemned for death for only one of two reasons. One, if they had committed treason, or two, if they had committed patricide, which is the killing of their father. Going even further than this is crucifixion was one of the most disgraceful forms of execution. It was usually reserved for slaves, foreigners, revolutionaries, or vile criminals. The only time a Roman citizen was ever crucified was for desertion of the army. And so we see several like Roman laws right here which protect him. And so we see this conversation between the commander and Paul, and the commander is horrified. He's horrified because he understood the law and the rite of passage for Romans. The interrogation immediately stops, and the commander is alarmed. And here's an interesting moment, and I want you to hear this. While the Jews were trying to take away Paul's life, while the Jews were trying to take away Paul's life, it was his Roman citizenship was the thing that saved it. His Roman citizenship, the thing that the Jews hated more than anything, his Roman citizenship was the thing that saved it. These rights and these passages that he had by being a Roman citizen, he knew he was covered because he would not have an unfair trial or be killed. In the same way, we too have a citizenship that saves us. We have a citizenship that saves us. I don't know about you, but that makes me excited. So while Satan will try to demand our life, we can stand confident and bold in the claim that I am a citizen of heaven. I am a citizen of heaven. We did not have to buy it, but we were born with it. No matter who tries to renounce or denounce or even demand our life, we can stand confident knowing that we are covered by Jesus because we were born a heavenly citizen. So just like Bruce or Peter or Kal-El, those superheroes, we have a not-so-secret identity that we can cling to and claim. That in the darkest and scariest moment for Paul, he knows who he is and what he stands for. Do you also know that? Do you know who you are and what you stand for? Church, at the end of the day, I want to encourage you to listen to each other's stories. To be able to understand others. Right now it's really scary and unknown, and there will be times like that. But I want to encourage you to take the time to stop and to understand others. I hope that you can recognize and claim your dual identity, that you are a citizen of heaven and you are also a citizen of earth, wherever your citizenship may be in whatever country um, that resides. I hope that you know that you can be unstoppable in the knowledge of that dual identity, our born identity of heaven and earth as a citizen. We are citizens of both. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you that we were born citizens and we do not have to buy it, but you have given it to us because we were born of you, God. And I just pray that you would help us to claim it, that we can remember to be completely and utterly unstoppable in our love for people, because we are a heavenly citizen too. Walk with us, Lord, as we go through weird times that we're in. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you this week. Go in peace.